Thank you, Miss Kim. We appreciate that so much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, you recognize that uh, Lauren's mom is on the piano for her filling in while Lauren is away in uh, uh, Paris. In fact, she probably just arrived not too long ago uh, in Paris, and we want to keep her. She had some delay up in New York, and we want to keep her in our prayers and uh, for the next uh, month as she'll be gone and be back the first Sunday of August. And Kim, we appreciate you so much coming. And uh, Joe uh, is no stranger for those of you. He's sung special music for the Lord last week for us and uh, Lauren's dad. And he'll be leading us this morning in, uh, in our worship. Uh, Deborah got sick this morning as we got here. She's laying down in my office that diverticulitis just uh, hit her. She's got an appointment this afternoon right after church um, that I'll be taking her back to the ambulatory place. So you can keep Deborah in your prayers if you would. And we appreciate, Joe, you filling in at the spur of the moment there. And uh, I have a card here from Lauren that she wanted, uh, her mom gave me this morning to read to you. We took a love offering up. Some of you didn't have an opportunity. It was just kind of a spur of the moment. The Lord just laid on my heart that we needed to do this to help her have a little spending money when she goes over to Paris and does her studies and things there. And let me just read this to you. Dear Orchard Crest family, thank you so very much for the out love I received last Sunday. It was such a total unexpected blessing and so very needed for my trip. It is one of my greatest joys to play for all of you every Sunday. I will miss you all while I am away. I wished I could thank all of you with an individual note, but please know that I appreciate you all. Love, Lauren. And you can let her know that, and we'll keep her in our prayers and try to keep posted, keep updated how she's doing. We also want to... Pray for Alice Heslick's family. Alice, you know, has had a lot of death in her family this year. A son dying and a a daughter-in-law, I think, and just a lot of different things. And so last week, her granddaughter uh, died in a car accident. And uh, so uh, we want to uh, lift up Alex and her family, Alice Heslick and her family in our prayers Pray for all of our folks that are in the nursing facilities um, and all of our sick folks at home and different things. Continue praying for them. Sister Arlene Palmer, she fractured her shoulder, broke an area there, and, uh, what, about a week and a half ago? And uh, so pray for her healing and being able to get back with us. And pray for our nation. Amen. We want to pray for our nation. Continue lifting up people who serves our nation uh, in every capacity, in the military, and in, uh, but also thankful for those in the services of our police force and firemen, EMTs, all the people who serve in those capacities, keeps things going. And uh, we're going to do a pledge here in just a moment to the flag and thankful uh, for the country that we live in. Do want to wish Miss Cookie a happy birthday today, Miss Cookie. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And uh, hope Gary's taking good care of you. Maybe he'll buy you a meal for your birthday. He can cook. That rascal can cook. So I know he's taking care of her. Um, And we'll have a prayer, and then let's do a pledge of allegiance, if you would, please. Dear Father, I want to thank you today for the blessings of living in America. We don't really know how to appreciate it until we've gone somewhere else. And to realize that as bad as it is, that it's better than any place that we could imagine being. And if we don't believe that, then, Lord, uh, folks just need to take off and go and see for themselves. Uh, Because we'll be thankful when we come back. And one of the most thankful things that I've experienced in flying back into the United States of America was the Statue of Liberty. And seeing our flags that are posted that represent so much. Help us to bring back honor and pride into this nation. 
Help us to reestablish ourselves as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Bless those who are sick. Be with Deborah today and help her to feel better. And others who are sick, Lord, the unspoken request, you know the many concerns. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Before our offering, would you stand with me, please, as we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Are we having choir? Anyone coming for choir? Everyone stand and worship with us as we sing four horse verses.
seated for our second song. My country, tis of thee. We will sing all four verses. and Amy. Thank you so much. Sometimes we just have to fill in. You did a good job, Brother Joe, on that. It's good that folks will can stand in at the spur of the moment to do that. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. We'll be reading verse 17 through verse 26. Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 17 through 26. The title of the message is Now or Later. Now or Later. While you are finding your scriptures and things, uh, a couple things just to mention. We're not on Facebook, I don't believe, are we, Greg? We couldn't, or some, our uh, Wi Fi's down or something. So we got our tech guys try to check it out and things, but. No good. I don't know too much heat or what it was, but uh, but anyway, our services. I guess Greg, you're putting them on for those folks that be watching it later. Will be on YouTube. They're being recorded, so that that will be on there later for folks. A lot of folks watch it on YouTube. Anyway, so we'll make a posting or something on our website to let folks know we need to kind of put that up, post it up, so they can know to check out YouTube for it. Um, and the other thing is that uh, Wednesday night we had church council meeting. We'll not, we're going to put our Wednesday night services on pause until the first Wednesday of September. So no Wednesday night service this coming Wednesday, not until uh, the first Wednesday of September on that. With the heat, the, the, the expenses of the air conditioners, the things that's going and attendance kind of dwindles down through the summer a little bit and things. So anyway, we'll try to double up on Sunday morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's read and look at the scriptures here together. And he came down with them and stood in the plain. And the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. 
And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto their prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word and grant understanding to our hearts today as we share together the message. I don't, you, you, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, maybe some, some of you, maybe most of you did, but way back when, before I surrendered into the ministry and things, I, well, I worked, come out of high school, worked, uh, I worked at a restaurant going through high school and different things and washing dishes and short order cook since, uh, gosh, I was like 15 years old, hired Johnson's Holiday Inn. And then went to a steel factory and worked uh, for a while, became a work leader there and went through other things in my life and uh, began to work uh, for a guy at a service station for a little while and ended up getting two of my own service stations before and all this process of running from the Lord. So doing all that and, and, you know, back then we could work on cars. I don't know about that. I'd have to have a machine. I had to have artificial intelligence tell me what, what's wrong with it, I guess. But uh, we could tune them up and balancing tires and oil and, and even rebuilding things, you know, engines and things. But I remember years ago, way back when, that there was this commercial that came on TV. You don't see them anymore. But it was a commercial, and if you've seen it, you remember this garage mechanic is talking to his customer. And uh, the customer didn't change their oil regularly in their car. And he just, he was constantly telling the customer how they needed to change, you know, the, the oil, and, and, uh, and he had hold up a Fram oil filter. And I can remember them Fram oil filters, you know, and air filter, all the different things, his selling this product. And, and the long story short, the, the mechanic was telling the customer, says, if you don't change your oil rig, you're going to, have, you're going to end up and uh, your engine's going to blow up, your engine's going to burn up or something that's going to happen. So you need to change your oil filter. So he said, so you can either pay me now, because they was talking about these oil filters are too high. That's all. He said, you can pay me now. And this was... In the commercial, the sales item, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And so there's a lot of things. And I thought that now that was, I mean, this ages you when you go back. I mean, and, and to, that far back for advertisements. But, you know, there are many people who don't pay attention. They neglect medical problems. And they just let it go that there's problems they're having, situations or so on. And they end up paying more later because of bad health. Not taking care of things. You know, we're the world's worst probably when it comes to procrastination. Don't say anything. Somebody will know who you are your wife or your husband or your friend or somebody that knows you says, yeah, that's right. I'm fortunate that Debbie is, Deborah isn't in here right now. But when it comes to putting things off so I can do them later, I can always do them later. Going to a dentist. See, a lot of people that have 
then you have a little cavity that you could just, you could get that taken care of. It wouldn't be bad. Of course, if you brush your teeth, take care of it. They say floss, and, and I'm like a dog on a leash. When I floss, you can pull me around with that floss. It gets stuck in my teeth, and I'm like, I can't do this. I can't. So I have to do that little water jet thing, you know. I, li- I like my little uh, water pick. And I do it. So all the different things they do. So when you go to the dentist and they say, they could say the same thing. Because you might have, some of you have probably lost a tooth or two. Uh, don't hold your hand up. And because uh, I'd have to put mine up too. But you're doing all the different things you do because of lack of maintenance, of taking care of some things within your life. The same is true, is it not? That taking care of small things within your marriage, taking care of small things, not just in your life individually or whatever to do, things that become big. If they've been addressed and taken care of or solved way back when, when issues began began to get involved or happen, then you see that it would kind of help. Sometimes it hits us right in the face that we couldn't do anything. We didn't know. We didn't have any problems. Genetically, you could have uh, cancer. Genetically, you have heart disease. You could have things that you didn't know you had until all at once till it showed up. Start having pain. Start having uh, loss of memory and different things that you could have things like that that affect you. So you could probably say the doctor, the dentist, and different ones would say, well, you can pay me now, you know, because we're always complaining. Well, that's too high. I can't do that. Go in there. Cost me this much. There is nothing that can take the place of having good health in your life to take care of no matter what the money is because you know you're not going to take that with you when you leave this world. Mm -mm. And in fact, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So even this old body, this fleshly body, is not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. We'll leave this body. But here in Luke chapter 6, it seems that Jesus is saying the same thing now or later. You probably noticed the highlight of the words, now, Jesus said. I want you to notice, look with me at four things here, because he tells us that we're blessed and can be happy if we experience certain things now. If we don't, now, then later. And it's just the opposite of what you expect. You know, you can either be, you can be miserable down here, but you have a promise of being happy up there. But there are some things about that. There are ingredients about that that's going to determine whether you can or not because I kind of feel like that for some people that are bitter and hateful and angry and all the different things because down here, because the Lord gives us a joy that no one can take away within our hearts and within our lives. And so don't misread this. Don't misinterpret this. To look at to say, well, I'm not supposed to be happy down here. I'm not supposed to be. No, that's, not, that's not true. You want to look at Look at four things with me. Number one. You can be poor, what Jesus is saying in Scripture, now or later. What, what does the terminology poor? In verse 20, Jesus lifted up his eyes to his disciples and he said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Being poor was to have the sense of, of humility within your spirit. Because it is when, when you're not sufficient here on the other things, and we'll get to that in just a moment, then you have a different spirit about you. There are different things that happens. In verse 24, but Jesus says, Woe unto you that are rich, for you will receive, you, you have received your consolation. So he says, Those that are rich are self sufficient, self absorbed. According to the Bible, in James chapter 2, verse 5, the poor have an advantage over the rich. It's easier for them to have faith. Because they're not reliant upon things if you're self-sufficient. That you can have within your life is to have faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how much, what is the measure of faith? You remember what Jesus said? Just enough, if we had just the, the measure of faith of like the widow woman with the two mites. 
if we had that much faith, we, Jesus, we could speak to mountains and have them move if we had the faith that the Lord required us to have. But you see, we oftentimes say we have faith and then we come to the place to where our faith isn't working for us. Then we begin to complain and we begin to struggle with the ideas of things because we want things. We want to feel the needs within our life. We're not relishing in the fact of here of being humble in our spirit because we don't, sure, we don't have everything like everybody else has. We don't, but we don't need everything like everybody else has. All we need is God. All we need is a relationship with God within our life. And then when we have that, according to Matthew 6, which says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When you come to that point to put your faith in God, trust God. And that's the thing that we can rely upon and to know here as we look at it in the scriptures is that when we have that faith, Listen to Mark chapter 10, verse 23. Jesus mentions the difficulty of a rich man going into heaven. In verse 23, Mark chapter 10, Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, he gives the answer, than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Notice how many times Jesus is talking about the importance about going to heaven, entering into heaven. In the afterlife to say that here in your life determining the fact of whether you're going to heaven or not. You got to have it right now. When I'm saying not this stuff, this stuff, I'm saying you got to have it right now is to have the faith that is required of you to trust and to be humbled within your spirit before Almighty God to trust in Him for the needs within your life. That's why Jesus could say, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in verse 25, He says, It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Then for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, some have said that, that Jesus at the time was looking there at Jerusalem at the walls and a place of entering in. There was a place that was called the needle to where, and there was that where men walked through or people could walk through, but a camel could not go through there because of the humps on their back. And as it was there, and that he might have been using that as a point of reference when he was speaking to his disciples. In verse 26, it says, They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who can be saved? Jesus looking at them, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered, said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold, notice the word now, in this time, that is in this life right now, that when you put your faith in God that you will receive these things, you know, many people mark off in family situations that leave and they don't have good family relationships. But if you are right with God and you're in the right place that God has you within the family of God, then you've got more brothers and sisters and, and father, you've got people that just adopt you in the family of God that when you trust the Lord, that's the way church ought to be, is to have that kind of friendship. Jesus said in verse 30, but he shall receive a hundredfold. Who? Those who have forsaken all of the things that keeps them from God. He could have been thinking about the one that said, uh, Jesus called him and said, come and follow me. One said, I can't. You know, his expression was, because I bought a yoke of oxen. Another one said, I can't because I bought some land. And another one said, I can't because I just took a wife. 
You know, there, there's all kinds of reasons why we decide to whether that we're going to follow or look into, I'm, I intend to follow the Lord later. I'm going to get closer to the Lord later. The truth is that we need to stay close to the Lord all the time. We, we need to draw up and get closer to him all the time. So when he said in verse 30, he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. But he did say with persecutions. Didn't mean that you weren't going to have some difficulty because life is tough sometimes, isn't it? Of all the different things. But he said in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, as Jesus was talking to them. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And notice it says, as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. They shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Notice how Jesus is telling them all the things that's going to happen to him later. As he's projecting, he's telling them now, this is going to happen later. But they weren't connecting. Notice what a couple of the disciples said in verse 35. James and John, who are called the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebdi, come unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Will you give me what I want? That's what we want, isn't it? That's what, would you, Lord, Lord, if you would, if you would give me what I want, I'll do what you want me to do. The problem is the Lord can carry out his end of the bargain, but most of us don't carry out ours. Amen. Would you give us whatsoever we desire? And he said unto them, verse 36, what would you that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand, in thy glory. What they were asking for were seats or positions of power. Let one sit on the right, but let one sit on the left. Here's the brothers. Hey, we followed you all these different things. Let us sit there. And, of course, Jesus was telling us it's not later on in Scripture that, that this was only for the Father to designate those areas. It wasn't for him in giving that positions or whatever that might be. And, but you notice the selfishness that comes in to the close ones that are right there with the Lord Jesus Christ. The very ones who are following him. And he's told all these different things. Blessed are you. And be humble in spirit. This don't look like much hum humility to me, does it you? That when he's coming here to look. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 kind of tells us what Jesus wants to be a poor in spirit. It says, the poor in spirit admit their own inability to save themselves and to trust Christ as Savior. So when we come to the place to say, we sing a song that says, he's all I need. Or when we surrender ourselves to know, I can't do this, but God can. I don't know how. When you resolve whatever problems, whatever difficulties are coming in your life, but you need to do that now. You need to resolve the issues within your life to come to the place to be humble in your spirit and to yield yourself totally into the hands, fully surrendered into the hands of God and to understand his blessings that will come when you have such humility. Blessed or happy is that person. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, after being saved, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells you how to be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. There's that word faith. Not of works. You can't do that. You can't just, I'm going to quit doing it. I've got to get my, everything worked out in my life. And then I intend to join the church. I've got to get this worked out. Well, I'm this way. They won't want me this way or that. I can tell you this morning, God saves sinners. God cleanses us. God forgives us. God puts a newness within our spirit, a new desire within us to draw us to himself. 
So when we look at verse 24 of our text, Jesus pronounces a woe upon the proud and the self-sufficient. They refuse to be poor in spirit now, so they will be poor later in eternity. Remember in Luke 16, the rich man is a good indication of that when he died, isn't he? When in hell he lifted up his eyes. He had everything, they say now, until he died and ended up in hell. And then he was in need. And all he wanted, if he could have just had a drop of water, he didn't ask for any money, didn't ask for anything else. He said, just send light. And put, I am tormented in these flames. You know, that's the thing, that you'll be, you'll be tremendously surprised at how little that you're going to really want in hell compared to what you want right now in this life. You want everything, all the different things, versus those who have very little. They have hardly anything in this life. But day by day, we just keep getting closer to the Lord. We, try to, we make it the best we can, and we do all we can but hopefully that it brings us to that point of humility in our spirit to draw us to him because that's where we're happiest. The second thing, you can be hungry now or later. I would say you can be, the first one was you can be poor, or you can be hungry now or later. Verse 21 is explained in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So when you say, what are we to be hungry for? We are to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. This is the problem. This is what today is. Uh, we're celebrating Independence Day. Fourth of July is in two days. And do you know that as I left my home today, it's almost disgraceful to look around and to see in such a nation as we live how little effort is put forth that people are not, they're just not patriotic anymore. Maybe I can say I don't blame you for not feeling good about this or saying whatever, but as I said in my prayer earlier this morning, if, if, you, don't, if you don't like, if you don't love America, I like that saying, if you don't love America, leave it. Do us all a favor. If you don't love it, leave it. I don't like the way it is, but I still love the principles of what America stands for. I still love the flag. I still honor and respect our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, what it stands. What we are to do, as we understand here, is that we are to hunger for righteousness. We have lost out on the aspect of right. Look how immoral and the reason why that we, we stopped hungering for righteousness and look what we got. We got all the sense of immorality that has come into our land that has filled it and it's taken away the rights of people that are there to stand upon and instead of standing for rights, we're standing for wrongs. We're calling, we're saying wrongs are right and, and this is, and, and like in our, in, in, in our laws and stuff, it's saying that you are guilty until proven innocent instead of you're innocent until you're proven guilty. And we just prejudge and we, everything that we do until we say, and we don't know what to believe because we've been told so many lies about who, what, and we're in such a uh, disarray with all the things, but I know one that knows the truth. One who is the truth. And Jesus said that he is the truth and we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. And I believe that what Jesus is telling us, that we can either hunger for this righteousness now. We're to hunger, like the psalmist said in Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry, thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary. And we ought to, we ought to hunger for, for righteousness. We ought to thirst for righteousness like Israel was when they began to cry out because there was no water in the land. They come through that desert land as they were there, and they knew they were going to die. And I can tell you, unless we find the righteousness of God, I can tell you we're going to die sooner. Because the wages of sin is what? That's what the Bible says. 
Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hunger and thirst after God for salvation, but we must also hunger and thirst after God and his word for fellowship and for learning. And we have lost that, that we have no sense of capacity to learn the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, Peter writes and says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, lay it aside, he says, as newborn babes desire the milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That if you you have tasted the goodness of God, you say, I was saved one time way back. I remember when I was saved, I can remember what happened, how good I felt when I was saved. Maybe if you haven't, then you can do that today. But if you remember what that felt like and go back, he's saying, then you ought to be desiring and hungering for that once again that God would fill you because he is the only one can satisfy what you're looking for. He is the only one. It's not anybody else that's going to do that. If you're looking for people to do that for you and to help make you, if you're looking for things to help make you satisfied and happy within your life and all the different things, all that it's going to come down to is that we need him. And the way that we find him and look at, we search for him. We cry out to him. And the Bible says he will hear us. Draw near to him, the Bible says, while he is close by, while he is near as we're coming. Peter says, laying aside all this mouse, everything is all the God. We need an old-fashioned repentance around the altar to where we all come and we lay before God our unrighteousness so we can be filled with his righteousness. We can't change America by what we're doing. The same is true with dying, hanging on churches, all the different things that's coming, that it's inside the heart, a struggling family, a struggling individual. You're depending upon somebody else to do for you what you need to do to get to God that God can do for you and God only can do for you. It's to come in repentance and confession and remorse and open your heart and let God fill it with his love and his grace and his power. God will sustain you, but you've got to have a hunger for him. I didn't own a Bible when I surrendered preach. That's kind of weird. But what's even weirder is I didn't know the Bible. It was even weirder. Didn't know anything about the Bible. I, you know, all the things. That was because I didn't own a Bible, didn't hear it, and I hadn't been in church all that much and things. But the thing that I did know is that God had called me. Took me a while to get sorted out on that thing. But I tell you, what happened in my life when I surrendered September 17th, 1974, what happened around the altar there in my life is after that when the church presented me with with a brand new spanking, mm, new pages in that Bible smell good. Thumb index, because I didn't know where anything was in the Bible. I wore all them index things off my Bible over the years, and there was no thumb indexes. There's the first Thessalonians or Hosea or whatever it was, and I could find it when somebody was talking about it. But, oh, I just had, it just created within me, I have to say, it created within me a hunger. As I began to read... I was fascinated by what I was reading within the Bible. Things I'd never heard before in my life. You know, oh, if we could just simply have that newness and that freshness within our walk with God, that we'd come to the place as though for the very first time. I think people shut God down sometimes. Oh, say, oh, I've heard that before. I've heard this or that. I don't, and we just kind of mark it off. As though it's like, it's old news. Well, I want to tell you, the Bible is the good news, and it's the living word, and it's continually relevant within life. It is fresh and anew, and it tells you so many different things. Every time you read read the same scripture, and you might get some other word from God. 
But there ought to be a hunger and a thirst within our soul to learn more about the Lord. I just really, and, and to have it, and I remember doing it, that's what set my soul afire when I was, when I surrendered my life to preach the gospel and go where I didn't know that I was going to be going or wherever it might be, willing to go and to follow. Whether you're a preacher or not, when we become Christians, followers of Christ, we are to yield ourselves to that point, not my will, Lord, but yours. You do with me what you want. Feel my hunger and my thirst. But you know what we start immediately trying to do? We start immediately trying to fill it with other things after we kind of, we get saved. And then we start building our lives around it. And we forget to ask God in the direction of how he wants us to live, what he wants us to do, and what we can do for him. We forget all about that. That's why we have drifted as America. That's why we're no longer America that in God we trust. We should pattern our lives after the Bereans. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10 through verse 12, it says, As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures. Notice this. They examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, and as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. That was the New International Version. So even the Lord himself in Hebrews 10, 7 says, Then said I, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Even Jesus was saying to the Father as he prayed in the garden, Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. When we hunger and thirst, we can sing that song, Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. That we can have such a craving that we can get to the altar or find a place where we can pray and to say, Lord, I hunger for you, I thirst for you, I want to know more of you. I want more of you in me and less of me. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. That's the thing that we have to do is giving out. Some people come in and say, oh, I want to be filled with the Lord. What we do when we come to church, and you've heard me say this, what we're doing right now is we're in the process of emptying ourselves. And as we empty ourselves, repentance and confession, yielding to the Lord, Saying, agreeing with the preacher, yeah, Lord, that's right. So nobody else can hear you saying it within yourself. Yeah, that's me. I've got, this is where I am. I, I, Lord, I, I'm struggling. I'm struggling in my Bible reading because I don't want to read the Bible. Bible is God speaking to you. That's God's word. The Bible. And then he'll speak to you through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance and things and different things that he'll guide you in your life. So what we want to do is that we want to have more of him in us, but he can't fill an already filled vessel. So what we want to do today is to have that hunger. And you know, when you're full, you're not hungry. But we need to be hungry now, or we're going to be hungry later. And then, number three, you can weep now or later, Jesus says in verse 21 and verse 25. The parallel to this verse in Luke is found in Matthew 5, 4. And he says, the ones that mourn now, the ones that weep now, shall laugh and be comforted later. I like what the psalmist says. Weeping endures for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. That's a good song, by the way. You know, when it comes to that you're struggling, if you're having that, if you're just struggling, if it brings to you within your heart, I want you to hang on to the fact of knowing that God wants to give you joy. God will help you through the times of weeping. Weeping is an expression for us to express out and to pour out what we feel as a release 
that when we come before the Lord. And so he uses this to say that if we mourn now, we shall laugh and be comforted later. If you sincerely mourn, repent over sin now, you'll probably come to Christ as your Savior. If you know you have sin in your life. And you confess that, you repent of that. That means repent, that turnabout. It's just an about face. Go the next, the other direction, opposite direction. Not a 360. You turn all the way around, you find yourself right back where you are. But when you're walking this way in your life, and God says you're going the wrong way, do it an about face and head back to him. Come back to him. That's what we need in our life. We need to do, you see, but when do we do that? We need to do that right when the Lord is speaking to your heart. When you feel him speaking, when he's knocking at the door of your heart, when he gives you direction in your life and leadership. So we can weep now or we'll weep later. As a Christian, if you sincerely mourn over sins committed, you'll have and know the joy of forgiveness later, according to the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It says, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. He's talking to Christians. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we, he's talking to Christians, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if we do not mourn over sin, we will mourn later as a Christian. I know I have sin in my life, and I don't mourn over that sin right now. I'm saved, yes. Then that time at the judgment seat of Christ, we talked about the rapture just the last few weeks, the meeting in the air, is that there at the judgment seat of Christ, that's where that weeping is going to take place because that's where we'll be judged, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for what we've done whether it be good or bad. Fast forward to Revelation 21, verse 4. When John is talking about, John the apostle who's on the Isle of Patmos is talking about, says, and God shall wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. These are the eyes of people that are there in heaven right now. What are the tears? You see, there are, tear, there, there are tears, there will be tears in heaven right now, but God's going to wipe them away, and then there won't be any more crying. There won't be any more after that judgment seat of Christ for the Christians. But if you're lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you've heard him speaking to your heart now and then, and you felt bad about your sins, but you don't weep over your sins here as in this life, and you die lost, then later... At the white throne judgment. Later, before the white throne judgment in hell. You will weep. You will cry out. When you should have done it now. It's to weep now. We don't have, we don't have enough tears, enough remorse. To weep over the things that is happening. We are to be filling the altar in every church in America. And weeping over what has happened to us as a Christian nation. We are to be at the altar, weeping, prostrate, weeping with our faces down and crying out to God and saying, God, how did we ever get in such bad shape? Same thing that happened with the Bible being taken out of the school, the Declaration of Independence, all the, the Ten Commandments, all the different things that have happened that pulls us away from God. The fourth thing and last, you can be rewarded now or later. Some people like the rewards now. True Christians will suffer for Christ sometime in their lives. Listen to what Jesus said in John 15, verse 18 through 21. If the world hates you, you know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now he's talking, Jesus is talking to his disciples, those who are believers, these Christians. Verse 20, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, 
they will also persecute you. You, if they have kept my saying, they will hate yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Jesus was saying they don't know God. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you can't know God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So you have to know that to, and understand that. At the judgment seat of Christ will be a place of rewards for Christians, for believers. Paul talks about it, said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And those also who love or look forward to the return, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy. So when you, you have the right kind of hunger... And you feel in that poverty of your spirit of humility. And you go through weeping in this life. And you have pains and struggles and difficulties. You know, we need to redirect those things of our lives and turn those over into positives and not negatives. And to understand that God has something better prepared for you later something better so you can wait until the end and you can get your rewards now which those won't go to heaven with you you can get all of that because flesh and blood won't inherit the kingdom of heaven you can't take any perish of all the anything with you your gold your silver your money you can't the only thing that's going to last in your life is the things that you do for the lord jesus christ in this life, of making you hungering for him. And I want to ask you this morning, have you made that commitment of your heart? Have you ever known what it is like to hunger after God here within your heart to really desire to know him? You've heard about him, and you say, I really, I, I don't know of a point, a time of when I really knew that I was saved. Well, God honors his word, dear friend. And if you really want to know, hear his voice call you to come. Answer that call within your heart. It's your choice. God gives us all that choice. And say, Lord, fill me. Fill my hunger. Fill my thirst with your righteousness. So I can live pleasing to you and that when I die, that I go to be with you in heaven. Having eternal life. If you've done that, good. But if you haven't, I'd like to meet you right up here. But if you have done that, maybe God is saying to you that you need to refresh yourself to get back. Because how long has it been since you've really, really... As a Christian now, you say, well, I got my foot in the door. And I'm ready to go to heaven. I got fire insurance, you know, here. Is that I know I'm saved. But what is it you're doing? Don't give up doing for Christ. People are watching you. People are, the world needs to see that we really believe in God, that we really believe in Jesus, and that we are living based upon God's provision of our life. God will take care of everything. Just like this old mess this country's in, God will take care of that. If we just simply seek to be filled with his righteousness, God will take care of everything else. Church, home, individual life, politics, nation, that if we just simply hunger and ask God, we've got to sit at his dining table and, and just sit down and eat and drink of his righteousness and be it full. But then when you go out, I've got to tell you, you've got to keep being filled. That's what Paul says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. That the, the feeling, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a one-time experience. He comes in baptism of the Holy Spirit, the ghost indwells you and makes you alive. But you have to keep yourself anewed, afresh, again and again. Now, I'm not saying you have to come to this altar every time you're in church. 
If you want to, you're welcome. You can come up there. But that's not it. Then, then that becomes mockery in a sense, if not careful, that people can just be to be seen. We want to see him. But when you feel the need, you certainly any time get up and get up that altar and pray and pour your heart out to God. But you can do that right where you are as well. But it's every day wherever you are within your home. When you get up in the morning, as you've emptied yourself, ask him to fill you, prepare you. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you that you have given us now another opportunity to draw closer to you. Fill our hungers and our thirst, Lord, with your righteousness, only by your grace, we're so undeserving. And we come and confess and repent before you now, in the name of Jesus, amen. I want you to stand with me, if you can, please. And as Joe leads us in our invitation hymn, if you're in the back of the church, the front, the middle, wherever you are, if you need to talk to me, if your Lord sent you to join this fellowship, you come. Or if you're just praying around this altar, whatever God tells you, you follow him as we sing. Back of the church, the front, the middle. Better now than later. Continue that next verse. All to Jesus I surrender. God knows whether you mean that within your heart. At his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. Step out from where you are. Somebody will step out and let you come. I surrender. About it. I surrender, make me save your Last verse, unless someone life. comes. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed. Kim, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here today. So glad to have you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord, hasn't it? And I surely hope that you have a safe and blessed Fourth of July. We've got a beautiful weekend this weekend. It's been hot and things, and we appreciate each of you coming today. We're glad that you're here. All right. Well, thank you. Continue to keep Deborah in your prayer. Um, I'll be taking her this afternoon to ambulatory again she was there about uh, about 11 days ago or so 12 and and she's really having a bout with this diverticulitis so it's a lot very painful for her um, she's had it a time or two and this time seems to be the hardest for her so and we got others to remember in prayer I know I see Mike and Janice here today and I'm so glad to see you I know you started back on your treatment Janice and Friday this coming Friday again, so we want to keep Janice in our prayers for that as well. So thank you again, Joe, for uh, filling in for Deborah this morning, and Kim for filling in for Lauren, and we'll see you back next Sunday. We appreciate that so much. So if you'll lead us in our dismissal song, and I'll make my way out the door, and I'll meet you guys out there. Uh,
Thank you. 